morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. Good to see you all here. Let's all stand, if you would, all over the building. He's worthy of our worship this morning, so let's sing together, everybody. Worship His holy 
and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore oh bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like this Eat. 
Would you say amen? Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Now y'all awake. Y'all, how did I catch up? There's always one, isn't it? Always one. Thank you, Mr. Ed. Good morning. So glad you made a choice to be here today. Good looking, bu- good looking bunch here with us this morning. Want to just take a few minutes to make a few announcements. I really hate to mess this up. Such a flow, such a wonderful service going on this morning. And um, just want to just settle down just for a moment and then give them time to build us back up and worship again. Tonight, in Meridian, Dr. Fred Luter will be there at 6 p.m. If you can possibly go, there's some sheets here. I know some are going with us and um, we're just excited about the Evangelism Conference Unhindered. For the gospel. How about you? Are you hindered? Do things keep you from being involved in the gospel? I think it's going to be a great evening and a great day tomorrow for any who can come be part of that. Starts in the morning around 9 8 a.m. We'll conclude tomorrow night about 7 30 or 8. You can stay for any part of that or all of that. If you'd like to come, it is everyone is welcome to come. Um, just want to make sure you know that. Well, let me just tell you just a little history. Uh, set up a couple of things. Uh, yesterday was a very, very special day. Uh, we had the privilege and opportunity to go to South Haven, Mississippi, and to walk a sweet young lady, Miss Sophia Aguilar, down the aisle. And I leave Mama sitting for this moment to give her time to do all that stuff that she needs to do. But man, it was a great day. Beautiful church, beautiful setting, beautiful environment, beautiful bride, beautiful everything. Man, it was just a great time. Had a few friends with us there and had the opportunity to spend time with Miss Sonia. And then she is here with us this morning. Um, Come on up here, Sonia. Beverly, come with Sonia if you would. Just let me just, some, some folks here might not know kind of the connection. This is one of our, we call them our missionaries. They're, they're natives to their country, but they serve in uh, La Esperanza and the areas around that in uh, Honduras. And uh, if you'd come back Wednesday night, she and I are going to just have a little Q&A right here, give her an opportunity to share. She's just a little cautious about that, and uh, I've assured her I won't ask her a hard one. But uh, normally Samuel is the storefront, and he's the one that says it all, and she just is the hands and feet of the ministry. But he couldn't be here, and most of you know the story. Uh, They've been working for a, a period of time trying to get all their paperwork to come to the States for this wedding yesterday. And it just wasn't to be, and we don't understand all of that in, in this, on this side of, of glory, but it didn't happen. And uh, Samuel had called me and, and Sophia some months ago, and, and I had the opportunity to go and to walk her down the aisle, to give her away on behalf of Dad and the rest of the family and Miss Sonia. And it was, a, it was a great day. But our relationship started back around 2007, 2008. Brother Greg was a pastor then, and he and I went and met Samuel in Tegucigalpa, and then we left there and went to Nicaragua, and Samuel was our translator. And that was my first real meeting and getting to know him. Brother Greg had met him and knew him a little bit before, but we just fell in love with one another. Our, friend, our fellowship became so sweet, and ending that trip, we came back by their home, and Sonia, and at that time they had two children at that time, this is around 2007, uh, eight, somewhere in there, and the girls were like this size and this size, and Sonia and I were in the back as well, and the four of us sat in the back of a little, well, like we would recognize a little S10 with the little jump seats in the back. The four of us rode in the back of there. The four of us rode in the back of there. She, I, and the two girls, and Brother Greg and Samuel in the front. And we rode for six hours, maybe, roughly roughly six hours to get to the drop-off place where we were being dropped off for the next carriers to take us where we were going. And that's how our mission adventure went. Well, met them, fell in love with them, and then we had the opportunity over the years to stay in touch and then to go back. Many in this room have been to their home and been very close to them over the years. But then in 2010, I believe, we had them here. 
And they stayed here some four, five, six weeks, stayed in our home, and was here to church and all the services. We had special events and all. And uh, uh, just, just grew to love these folks greatly. Many of you are connected with them on Facebook and so forth and so on. Many of you know them personally when they come. And today I just wanted her to come and, and you to see her. Uh, you see the Aguilars, the Sortos, and the Martinez. And you know Jorge and Yuli have been in recent years. But you might not have seen Sonia because it's been 10 years. Yes, sir. I think 10 years since they've been able to get stateside. So what a day it is to have her here with us. Now, we called Samuel crying dad yesterday, and he was pitiful. And I FaceTimed him, and I was pretty br brutal to him, to be honest with you. And uh, I told him I was recording it and putting it on YouTube yesterday afternoon. And he looked all over YouTube trying to find it, and he said, you sorry dog. <laughs> if I would have put it on there, he would have laughed. But he said, you sorry dog. And I said, no, I didn't put it on there. But anyway, the next thing is, today, following our service, Sonia and Beverly are going to be over in the fellowship hall near the coffee pot. Oh, I'm sorry, Beverly's got to go to Sunday school. Miss Jenny's going to be there with her. I hadn't asked her that. I forgot that. So Beverly won't, but Miss Jenny will be with her. And she has a little table set up. Go, go grab my little bag there, my little advertisement there, Bill. And uh, she's going to be sharing some things that you could pick up. Um, they're just ministry aids, things along the way. Um, I'm not even going to tell you. She'll tell you. But this is a handmade little uh, purse. I, I'm thinking all of us need one, guys. <laughs> and uh, don't nobody get their phone out now. I know y'all. <laughs> it's on YouTube anyway. I don't care. Uh, but anyway, it's a little handmade bag. And it is some kind of soft. And uh, those will be over there. And then she has some little bracelets and necklaces and earrings and things. And they're just things to aid their ministry. And she does this handmade. And then this is handmade, not by her, but by some locals. And uh, she just picks these bags up and uses them as ministry tools. And uh, she will be over there. And you can make some purchases or donations on that stuff if you'd like to do that. Just want to make it available. No pressure. But it's some pretty cool looking stuff. Now, she will also be here um, tonight in Meridian, if you want to go with us. And then tomorrow in Meridian. And then on Tuesday, there's a ladies 55 and older lunch, and she'll be there. And she'll have those things, but she'll be there in your fellowship. So you can get to hang out with her. It's always cool when we can do those things. And then Wednesday, they have some things going on. And then Thursday, there's a ladies Bible study, and she'll be back for that. And then early, early Friday morning, you have a task an appointment to pray for us as we travel to take her back. She has to be at the airport to depart at 6 a.m. So we'll have to have her there a couple of hours prior to that. So we'll be in the night, Friday night, you'll know you can, be, uh, Thursday night, you can be praying early Friday morning for us as we go. All right? So you got all that? Make sure you meet and greet her today. Before they leave, just stay there just one second. I want to make another announcement. Next Sunday, y'all know what's happening next Sunday? Micah's ordination service. His dad called me last night on the way home from a funeral. And he said, Brother Bill, I just want to give you a public service announcement for next Sunday. And I said, well, lay it on me, Brother Bruce, because he's a dude anyway. And he carries on more than I do. And uh, amen? amen? Amen, he does. And uh, anyway, and he says, I just want your folks to know, for all who plan to come next Sunday, that the best jambalaya, he said jambalaya, the best jambalaya in South Mississippi and maybe he said Louisiana too. Anyway, is going to be there after the five o'clock service at the reception. And he said, if your folks like jambalaya, it's going to be there. So tell them to come, get them a plate, a bowl, and eat and go back north. But we want you to come. That's next Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. for ordained ministers to be involved for the ordination council, 5 p.m. for everybody to be involved for the ordination service for Brother Micah. Next Sunday, Loosedale, Mississippi. Two and a half hours. We went three hours for a wedding yesterday. I walked down the aisle and said, her father and I, and that's about it. And, you know, oh, we can do that. So if you could go next Sunday afternoon, that's the plan for that. All right? A lot of announcements. I want to have a special prayer for this lady in their ministry. And I want you to join me and help me. Why don't you stand up? 
get ready for Brother Chuck and the team to come back. Do like we do. We're just kind of reaching out, reaching this direction. We want to pray for their ministry. And uh, Father, we just come into your presence this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts. Great and mighty are you, and you, you, you are worthy of our praise. We thank you, Father, for your Son and our Savior Jesus and the work of the ministry that he did. What we'll discuss and talk about in the message today as we do every time we meet. It's all about him. I pray, Father, for the ministry of the, the Aguilars. In Honduras, Lord, you know the family, you know everything about them, you know every move they make, you know every dot and tittle of their lives. Lord, they have left one here in the U.S. now that's going to be a new missionary here along with her husband down in Texas. And now, Father, as mom will be going back to the rest of the family within a week, we pray that you'll just work in their hearts. I know there'll be soft, tender places there, but we pray a special blessing upon them in the days and weeks and months and even years ahead as they continue to do the ministry around La Esperanza and surrounding areas and the villages and the mountains where they serve. I pray, Father, you bless them well and the rest of the family there today. I pray whatever their hands and feet are doing, that you would be honored and glorified and you would bless them and protect them. Give Sonia safety as she is here with us. Protect her and just give her a wonderful time. And I pray we'll shower her with blessings. And I pray, Father, that your will would be accomplished in and through her life and through their ministry. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Let's be seated. Well, just remain standing if you would. Love this old song. The blood will never lose its power. The blood Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power Reaches to the highest mountain, it flows to the lowest valley, the blood that gives me That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. And it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power, and it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will.
can sit down, you can and say amen if you believe that. Amen. Old song that we don't do a whole lot, but it's got a great message. I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful that my song shall ever be. love me a sinner condemned unclean I'm reminded of the uh, story and I love the story of the the Pharisee and the, the sinner that went in to pray and the Pharisee prayed and he prayed first Lord I'm thankful that I'm not like other men I'm thankful that I do all the things that I'm supposed to do and I'm I live right and I do right I'm thankful that I'm not I'm thankful I'm just a good person I'm not like this 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 other guy over here and the old sinner just prayed, Lord, I, all I can say is have mercy upon me, a sinner. I don't deserve it. Uh, how can it be that you could die for me? And that's the name of this song, How Can It Be? Hope I can hit this first note right. Messed it up at practice, but we'll get, we'll get it. Go. <laughs> Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. Lead my cause. You ride my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be? Afraid I've let you down Inside I doubt that you could love me 
But in your eyes there's only grace Thank you, praise team. Thank you, church. Open your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 5. Book of John, chapter 5. <clears throat> My wife encouraged me just now and said that I got one place in what I shared with you that we did a wedding yesterday. And in one place that I shared with you, we came home from the funeral. And you all know that somehow weddings and funerals, I've confessed this before, and I did it unknowingly again. Who heard me say funeral? The rest of y'all wasn't listening, but all of y'all got it. I got one or two in here to get it, and they'd tell me afterwards. I love it too, and I'm grateful for you. John chapter 5. Going to go about this just a tad different than the way we typically do. I know some of you would be surprised by that this morning. I want to start this morning by just saying, isn't it amazing how God is? Just in your life, we're going to pause through this message a few times this morning. I really, really don't even know how far we'll go because there's so, so much in the Word today that is so challenging and so encouraging. Now think about this story, this book of John chapter 5, and think about how this whole thing started. I said, when we're reading this in the beginning, I said that there was a place here where there was some healing began. You remember that? What happened? Where was that first healing? Where, where was that location of the first healing? When there was a guy laying there that couldn't make it into what? The pool of water. And wh where was that at? Hmm, that's a little harder. Bethesda. And how old or how long had that guy been like this? You remember how many years? 38. All right. He's winning all the points here. $100 gift for the best one that gets the most answers. <laughs> Due and payable sometime. And, uh, and, and then what happened? You remember he, he performed this miracle. It was, it was at the pool of Bethesda. And, 
and the guy had been lame for 38 years, and then there was something else happening. It was on what day of the week? The Sabbath. Now, was that wrong? According to the Jewish people, but not according to the Word of God, but the man-made, the man-made laws, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they said it's wrong. And Jesus performed this blessing on the Sabbath. Man, I'm telling you, if I was lame for 38 years and somebody would heal me and make me walk, hallelujah, I'd have went right on down to the church service just like he did in the story, right? But then there was a, this charge about Jesus doing that, and then he did something after that. What did he claim after that? You remember? He claimed to be who? Son of God. And was, he's guilty of that one, right? So that one he's guilty of. Because he is the Son of God. And he said, my father, he made himself me equal with him. Then, then, then we studied in verses 19 through 23, Jesus pled guilty because he was equal with God. Well, we continued, we continued reading and studying through the book. And then we see the Lord's testimony to his accusers. And it's going to continue on to the end of the chapter. And, and, and Jesus builds his case before them. And he points all of them to something that's important. He points them to something that we're trying to do as well. That Jesus is a sure witness for God. And that's really what today's message is about. In verse 34, Jesus pointed out that he was telling these things to his accusers that they might be saved. Why do you think the Lord did that? Just be vocal. Why would the Lord point out to his accusers he did this so that they might be saved? Why did, why did Jesus do that? Why does he point things out to people so that they might be saved? Because why? Because why? He wants everybody to be saved. Because he loves us. And he wants everybody to be saved. And you know what? That message hadn't changed. You know what? He was wanting them to pay close attention to the witnesses. And it's because Jesus loves lost people. And he wants them to be saved. God loved them. And today, let me assure you of this. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And that's our hope, folks. With all that in the background, we're going to look at verses 36 through 47, maybe try to get there. I'm changing it right now. We're, we're not going to read those verses. We're going to just kind of teach through them, and then we'll see how far we go. Let me just pray, and then we'll begin. Father, we just thank you for your word, and ask you, Father, this morning for clarity of your word. Somehow, some way, maybe I could just hide. Maybe the focus wouldn't have to be that they're looking at me, but they're looking into your word this morning. Because, Father, before we were ever formed in our mother's womb, you knew us. And the whole idea and the whole concept of what we're doing here this morning is we want everybody to know you. So, Father, I just pray this morning your will will be accomplished. Lord, speak truth into our heart through your word. Prepare our hearts to respond to your word. Help us be obedient to respond to your word. Oh, Father, bind the evil one would be my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Even at our best, even in the best situation possible, it's really hard for me to even to, to read and study and pray and seek his face and turn from to really get it, how much God really loves me. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, I just, I cling to that. And I, I know that's what the word teaches. But man, to really devour that and really treasure that. That's what he wants us to do, folks. He wants us to get to a deeper, closer, more personal relationship with you. I said it during the prayer, Jeremiah 1.5. Before we were formed in the mother's womb. He knew us. And, and his desire is that we get to know him that way. 
so intimate and so personal and so close. I, I think about all of the circumstances that are around everyone in this room this morning. Now, let's, let's, let's let me embellish just a moment. Think with me. In your mind, in your heart, just process with me. Now, you apply it, has it how it fits to you. But go back one, two, three, five, seven, nine, ten generations. I'll be honest with you. And I start thinking about how I got where I am today. I was thinking about this in the recent days, thinking about the privilege of yesterday. The relationships and what they mean. I, I'd just be I'd be remiss if I didn't do this. I was thinking of people like J.C. Gaunt. I was thinking of people like Rick Simmons. I was thinking of people like Mr. Kenny Boykin. And there are others, and I, I know I'm missing saying something about somebody, and that's a dangerous thing. But let me just tell you, those three men and their families have meant so much to me in my life and how God orchestrated and organized and allowed us to become part of something together. Man, I was thinking about how we went to Durango and five men, we went and we did the impossible, putting up a roof in a period of time that we wasn't supposed to. Man, God is amazing. Thinking about yesterday, that's what brought all this emotion and all these thoughts on this week. Thinking about, what do I say? How, what do I do? How do I respond? How, God, I'm so grateful and so thankful that you brought me where I am today. You realize all the dots that have to be connected? All the check marks that have to happen? I mean, you think about the generations. Every person that is in your genealogy line, how that happened. Well, you know, my great, 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 great grandmother and grandfather, they came and they met. And then they had children. And then those children, guess what they did? They had children. And, and just, just embellish that with me just a moment. And yours are the same. And for all these generations, all these things have happened with cause and with purpose. Not just something that happened, but it happened with a cause and a purpose. I believe it so much, I believe not one person is in this room by chance or by mistake or by some accident this morning. Even the one that would be here this morning say, well, you know, I almost didn't come this morning. It's not for the ones not here, it's for the people here this morning. God has a divine, perfect plan. A good and perfect plan for you and for I. He knew that plan before you and I were conceived in our mother's womb. And his desire, along with a lot of other desires he has for us, but is that you and I, most importantly, would come to an intimate, personal, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and know him better every day of our life. If we would do that, if we would accomplish that, everything in our life would be different. Everything would be different. I could call for testimony. How's your life different since you got saved? You know what I'm saying is true. Especially for those of us who have a lot of baggage. Like, when we look back, there's dust for miles back there, right? And we look back. But how God orchestrates and puts all those things together. You know, not in our time, but in previous ancestral times, people were just fortunate to have a child, and the child lived through the sicknesses and the illnesses. They didn't have all the shots and things that we have to protect a child hundreds of years ago. Pestilence, disease, cold weather, tragedy, just tough stuff. You and I are in this world today and where we are today because God gave us life. That's the only reason. There's nothing else that works. And down through the ages, God did billions, listen to me, billions of things, some small, some big, to make sure you are here today to hear the gospel. That's what I believe. I believe that's what the Word of God teaches and I believe we live it out every single day. It's not by chance. You make choices along the way which affect that. 
But I'm telling you this, if God wants you to get there, he'll see you to it. No matter what he has to do. Or how hard you're kicking and screaming and bucking. When he wants you somewhere, he'll show you the way. But you always have the choice to kick and scream and buck. Or you can willfully surrender your life and go and serve and do. Folks, I'm telling you, God made sure you're here today because he loves you. And God wants us to have earthly life that's gloriously wonderful. But he also wants everyone to have eternal life with him in heaven. Now listen. Matthew chapter 18 verse 14. Jesus said, It is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that any one of these should perish. You know what that tells me? God wants everybody to be saved. Could I get an amen? In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can I just tell you this morning? God wants you and I to repent. He wants us to be in right standing with Him today. God wants people to live forever in heaven. But He wants us to live our lives today with heaven already inherited into our lives. In other words, He wants us to be born again. Christ followers from this day forward. If you're already born again, He wants you to live it. If you're not and you're born again today, He wants you to get born again and live it. God wants people to live that way. Well, I see just two or three things that's got nothing to do with the text, right? You say It's got everything to do with the text. Two or three things. Number one, Brother Derek came to me on Wednesday night, and he said, hey, did I miss or did you not cover verse 31 in our text from Wednesday night? I kind of did. I went back and listened to it, but, but I didn't do some things, and I, I want to make sure I do that. And this is a good time to do it. Look at verse 31 of of John chapter 5. You can go back and watch the video and see where I didn't leave that or do that. I left it out. But here's what was said. Jesus said, I bear, bear witness of myself. And then it says, my witness is what? Not true. It says not true, right? I read it. And I, I, I shared just a tiny bit, but I really didn't go very deep there. So I just want to make sure that I cover that this morning and then we'll continue because we're just studying through the book anyway. Here's the key. We know that you have to take everything in context in the Word of God. Somebody say amen. You have to take chapter, verse, the whole thing front and back, all that put together. Well, we know, we know without a doubt that Jesus was not saying that his witness of himself was not true. That would counteract Scripture. So what does it say? Here's what the scripture is speaking. Here the word wasn't suggesting that Jesus was dishonest or not true. In fact, Titus chapter 1 verse 2 tells us that God cannot what? Lie. So we know that he is true. So we know that. Pastor William MacDonald, I actually had this in my notes, but I I did not share all of this. And I'm grateful for somebody asking Pastor William MacDonald, I spoke of him. He explained that Jesus was simply stating a general fact that the witness of a single person in that culture was considered insufficient evidence in the Jewish court of law in that day. God's divine decree was that at least two or three witnesses were required before a valid judgment could be formed. And so the Lord Jesus was about to give two or three more, or four actually, more examples in which follows in the verses. Again, the first witness is God the Father. And and he surely, surely witnessed for the goodness and the divinity of the Lord and Savior Jesus. And Jesus was possibly talking about this in verse 32. Now, um, this is a little different than what I said Wednesday night. It's not against what I said, but it's just a little addition. 
Verse 32, the Lord, there the Lord said, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. So again, two or three, Jesus testified, and then the word, I, I pretty much when I read through that, I generally think it's talking about John the Baptist because the next two verses start talking about John the Baptist. But here's pretty clear with some in-depth study. This is talking about where the original language, which we don't read in our translation, is talking about the original word here was there's another who will testify. Now when you think about another, who do you think about? The Holy Spirit. So here it is. Listen. This is a little deep for Sunday morning jumping into this, but we're going to get there. So another here is talking about another of the same kind. It's the same word in the original language where Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit in John 14, verse 16 and 17. So let me just give you this and then we'll jump on in the lesson. And just John 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus said, I will pray the thought to the Father and he will give you another helper or comforter that he may abide with you forever. Got to be the Holy Spirit. Wasn't going to be John the Baptist. Can I get an amen? amen? Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it never sees him, Holy Spirit, nor knows him. But you know him, we do, because he dwells in you and will be in you forever. Mm, amen? Jesus could have been talking about the Holy Spirit here, Heavenly Father, in verse 32. But in today's text now, in verse 36, I just wanted to go back and kind of, sometimes in the South, Michael, we say, we want to lick that calf over, you know. I just want to hit that uh, with a swab. If you weren't here and you don't know, don't get that. Go back and watch Wednesday night. Maybe they'll clear that up. And maybe Derek's the only person that questioned that. I don't know. But I thought I should correct that and make sure that I taught that. So here we find ourselves in verse 36, our text. Look at verse 36, 37, and 38. You ready? Here Jesus says, But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish this very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. Verse 37, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me, and you have neither heard his voice at any time or seen him his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Now, God the Father surely witnessed for the Son, amen? And he witnessed the goodness and the divinity of the Savior. God the Father said something about Jesus that God had never said about anyone else up until Jesus. It's found in Psalms 53 verse 3. Now just jot it down. Don't go there. And this is what the Bible says. God said every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. That was before Jesus, folks. God was testifying that before Jesus, there was none good. No, not one. See, when Jesus came, the Father gave the same testimony for Jesus, both in the beginning and near the end of his life. This is what he said in Matthew. Well, he said this in another place, but first, he said, This is my blessed Son, or my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then in Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17, when Jesus... Then he said this, Then Jesus, when he had began, had been baptized, came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I'm thinking God the Father checked the box and said, this is my son. 
in whom I am well pleased. Then, on the mountain of transfiguration, you remember the story found in Matthew 17, verse 4 and following, and the scripture says, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good. It's good for us to be here today. And if you wish, let me make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Remember the story? Verse 5 says, while he was still speaking, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowing them. And then suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. You see, folks, God the Father has surely witness for the Son that He is Lord. There's another witness here. It's found in the next verses, kind of in what we've read and in the additional verses. In verse 36, Jesus said, But I have greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish the very works that I bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Think about, think about this with me. Think about the works of Christ in the past in your life. Just think about it. Man, since God saved you, remember, remember, I'm just now 30 years old in Christ. Hallelujah. It has happened. I am older in Christ than I am in Satan. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for letting me see another day. Man, 30 years. Years of goodness. But let me just tell you, before the 30 years, he was so, so good to me. Because he got me to that place and that point. Remember, he lined up all the dots and the stars and made everything happen. And somehow, some way, protected me and shielded me. I don't understand it. God's amazing grace. I welcome it in my life. Now, think about it in Scripture. There's a couple of stories that just stir my heart. One is found in Mark chapter 4. I'd like for you to just look at that with me. You can just keep your page there somewhere, some kind of way. I'm not sure if we'll use John anymore or not. But go to Mark chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, right there. Chapter 4. Man, this is a cool story. Got two I want to share with you, and we'll see if we get back to the scripture of the day. <clears throat> Mark 4.35. I still hear pages. I love that sound. Never get so. Mark chapter 4 verse 35 says, On the same day. Everybody there say amen. amen. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let's cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. Man, there's a lot said right there. This is not the message, but boy, there's a lot there. And the other little boats were also with him. Verse 37 says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. In other words, the boat was sinking. Verse 38 says, But he was in the stern, asleep on the pillow, or on a pillow. And they awoke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Man, there's so, this is a great message within itself right here. This is one of my favorite stories. And then verse 39 says, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. That's all he said. That's all scripture records. Peace be still. And what does the Bible say? And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And verse 40 says, But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Or some translation even say little faith. Verse 41 says, And they feared exceedingly, exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Wow. When I think about the miracles of God. This 
ranks up in one of the top ones. In the original text, in original language as we think about this, we hear peace be still, three words. But in the original language, it was less. It was really only two words. And the one word, the powerful word in the deal was simply hush. Micah's got a baby. Some of you got little ones around. We had some that had been a long time. I tried it. It don't work. Hush. Shh. Hush. Beverly's got a dog. His name's Jack Bauer. I try it. People come to the house. They come to the door. And he just goes bananas. And I'm like, hush, shh, hush. There's no magic in the word. But there's power in the one who said the word, Jesus Christ. Hush. I can hear that. As I read this story, as I think about our awesome, amazing God, the wind is blowing, the waves are splashing, and he simply says, hush. And the water stops. And the wind stops and the Bible says there was a great calm. Can I just tell you something this morning? Maybe in this room is represented today some storms, some winds, some rain, just some stuff in your life. Let me just tell you what. It's not hopeless. You're not helpless. Because God the Father sent the Son And he sent the precious Holy Spirit and he abides today. And I'm telling you today on the authority of the word of God, based on the case we've already built up until this point, that Jesus is still on the throne and that he can calm any storm that you're in right now today. Let me just tell you, folks, you're either about to enter or maybe you've already entered or maybe you've just exited a storm. But that cycle... It's like this. It comes and goes, and it comes and goes, and it comes and goes. Nobody I know is free of storms. But I'm telling you this. Jesus can just say simply, hush. And a great calm can happen in your life today. I'm telling you. We serve an amazing God. Man, I think about those things. We have so many so many witnesses of the past. So many things. I think about the, the cripple in, in chapter 5 and the first few verses there. I think what a story that is. Also, I think about Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus heals the woman who had a blood issue of, of what, 11, 12 years. In John chapter 11, Jesus raised a man from the dead. What Baptist preachers have to do every Sunday because these folks go to sleep and you have to raise them from the dead. Different story, I'm sorry. But Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus had started his work in verse 36 of our text. But let me just tell you, Jesus wasn't finished. They might have wanted him to be finished, but he wasn't finished. Thinking about finishing. Every time I say that word, I think about what he did on the cross. Think about the things he said on the cross. I think about the Easter season that's coming that we celebrate. The death, burial, and the resurrection. He said, it is finished. And it was. Not all of it, but it was finished what he was doing. He came. He came to die on the cross and pay the full price for our sins. And then in John chapter 19, verse 30, when he said, it's finished. It's done. But thank God he wasn't finished because he went in a grave, stayed there three days, and he rose from the grave. Amen? Amen. And he still reigns today. You see, folks, there are wonderful works of Christ in the, fa- in the past, but now I want to I just tempt you. as I'm going to close right here. I want you to think about what do you think about the works of Christ in the present where we are today? Talked a lot about the past. That was my my thinking, what's been going on in my head. How all of us got here some way, somehow. But what about the present? What about the present? The question is, 
Do you this morning believe that God still works in the world we live in today? Do you? I hope you do. It's a critical question. Do you believe God still works in the world today? It's critical. Because if it's not, if he's not, then why would you pray? What are you praying to? What are you praying for if you don't believe God still works today? Do you believe God still works in the world today? Let me just tell you, if God is working in the world today, and He is, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If He's not, and we deny Scripture, like what the Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 12, 13, and 14, He said, Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the words that I do, the will I do also, and no and greater works than these he will do. Because I go to the Father, he's saying I'm going to send somebody that's going to do greater works. And whatever you ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified through the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Again, according, according to, you can't take it out of context, according to his will. The wonderful truth that Jesus is still at work in the world today is found in so many applications, in so many places. Hebrews 13, verse 8, he's the same what? Yesterday, today, and he's still at work. Amen? Take a, go to Psalms and take a left about seven or eight books. I think it's maybe seven books before. Second Kings. Just go back that way real quick. Let's close with this. Another one of my miracle stories that I love. Second Kings chapter 6. Look there quickly. Second Kings chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 8. I don't know where we'll stop here. Somewhere in a minute. Second Kings chapter 6. The Bible says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he took counsel with the servant saying, My camp will be in such and such place. Remember the story? Somebody say amen. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Verse 10. And then the king of Israel sent someone to the place which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of the king the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing and he called his servants and said to them will you not show me which of us is for the king or of of Israel excuse me verse 12 and one of the servants said none my lord o king but Elijah the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your own bedroom. Verse 13. So he said, go see where he is that I may send and get him. In other words, he wants an insider in this deal, right? And it was told to him saying, surely he is in Dothan. Verse 14. Don't speed up and get on through this. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Verse 16. 
So he answered, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Can I just tell you, folks, the Lord can open your and my eyes just like that today. He can. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and many times he'll do the same for us if we'll just pray and ask him. God wants us to see the hands of God at work in our current world today. He is still at work in this world, and he will continue until the day that he says it is finished. And when he does, I'm telling you, when he does and he comes back, folks, listen to me. There's going to be a great joy for those who have been born again. But there's going to be great suffering for those who have rejected him. Until the point of death. You see folks. The Bible says we must be born again. In our text. If we would continue reading in verse 39. It says search the scriptures. For in them. You think you have eternal light. And these. Which they testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me. That you may have life. Do you know this today? Today. There are people who know that they're lost, truly living in darkness, living in blindness. But for some reason, pride, for some reason, haughtiness, for some reason, selfishness, even for some reason, I'll say the word ignorance, is bliss. And people know that they don't know Christ savingly, but they'll go week after week and month after month and year after year. And they'll continue to reject. Folks, I'm telling you, he's coming back. And when he comes back, there won't be an opportunity at that point in time. You see that knee bowing and tongue confessing at that time isn't going to get you into heaven. The knee bowing and tongue confessing then is just going to do just what Scripture says. He is. He is. The Son of God. Today my prayer would be through, in my mind right now, seems to be a, a muddled up bunch of stuff tried to be thrown together because it wasn't at all what I thought I wanted to do this morning. But somehow, some way, if God was sharing in my heart and I'm trying to share with you what He has changed in my heart, we got to open our eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let me see that you are a witness of things to come. Today is a day of salvation. Now think about a lost and dying world. I don't want any part of that. But we're in it. So the way, the thing that we can do is continue to testify of the glory of God. Think about the things he's done. Think about the things he's doing, but look forward to the things he's going to do in our lives. We serve a great God. Amen. He loves you. Sent his son to die for you. And that's our hope. I know not what you need to do this morning, but I pray your eyes would be open through simple trusting Jesus Christ today. Brother Chuck and the team are coming. I want you to stand this morning. We just trust the Holy Spirit to convince and convict according to His plan and His will. Would you open our hearts and our minds and our lives this morning, Father, to the gospel? It seems to me as we have shared things this morning, the message is it's true. You did come. You did die. And you did send back a greater one. The comforter. The protector. 
the sweet, precious Holy Spirit. You are all of these things. I pray this morning that you'd have your way now as we make decisions. We can step across and continue on or we can surrender and submit. Maybe this morning some refocusing needs to happen. Resurrendering needs happening. Whatever needs to happen this day, Father, we trust you for your will to be accomplished. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.